Chapter 15, Aquaculture. The only ethical response to the collapse of the ocean, lake, and river ecosystems across the globe is to stop eating wild-caught aquatic plants and animals and start raising our own in clean environments while we restore the wild habitats. It will be far healthier for our bodies and better for the environment. Almost all the animals and fish we take out of the current ocean and river systems are tainted with toxins. They need to finish their life cycle, decompose, or be eaten. As for the mercury, atrazine, etc., they need to be returned to a place where they can do no harm. Ideally, trapped in the long carbon chains of the ocean, waterway, and wetland soils. All the wild fish populations must be encouraged to exponentially increase, either through seaweed farming or other creative means, and fisheries need to refrain from harvesting any fish for several seasons. The cycling will clean the oceans, the coastlines, and the wetlands, along with all the organisms dependent upon them as well. Orientation and placement. If ponds are placed against the prevailing wind, allowing it to blow over them, they get passive aeration naturally. This also has a cooling and evaporative effect. Placement so that the sun shines on the pond for long periods of time each day turns the pond both into a reflector and magnifier of that energy as well as a thermal mass that will even keep frost off of the trees planted around it. It should be noted that oxygen levels drop as the temperature rises, so shade is often important to keep waters within tolerable temperatures during summer and spring especially in hotter climates. Size and depth. Whether small or large, pond aquatic systems that are less wild and thus less self-sustaining need a lot of tending and inputs and they tend to have more problems. The wilder they can be, the better. Pond depths can range. Some people recommend them be two meters, 6.5 feet or shallower with deeper areas of four to five meters, 13 to 16 feet deep to retain fish if the pond has to be drained or for cold temperate climates to help fish survive through the winter. Sepp Holzer, on the other hand, commonly creates ponds or lakes 10 to 15 meters deep, 32 to 49 feet deep. Deep areas allow for certain fish to spawn, protection in winter, and higher oxygen levels. Shallow areas allow for spawning of other fish, lower oxygen areas, and temperature and pH differentiation. Shallow and deep areas also support different species guilds. Overall differences in the depths allows for constant movement of the water as well, which keeps it fertile and oxygenated. Yield. Aquaculture has the highest possible yield per unit of surface area because gravity isn't pulling on the organism in the water in the same way that it exerts this force on organisms out of the water and organisms are surrounded by nourishing water and nutrients similar to mycelium in a liquid culture. The ponds act as a nutrient trap, capturing silts and all the organic matter that breaks down in the water, forming a rich sludge that can be removed and used in gardens. Quote, a properly built and managed pond can yield from 100 to 300 pounds, 45 to 136 kilograms of fish annually for each acre, 4,000 square meters of water surface. That's from Ponds Planning Design Construction, NRCS 1997. Plant layers. Floating plants, edge plants, shallow water plants, deep water plants, though no deeper than eight feet, 2.4 meters. Trophic layers, algae, zooplankton, plants, Chinese water chestnut, Kang Kong, taro, cattails, water hyacinth, Indian water chestnut, lotus, arrowhead, shellfish, crustaceans, mollusks, and echinoderms. Fish, tilapia, catfish, bluegill, bass, carp, trout, perch, small to large water mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. Food chain. Algae feeds on sunlight and nitrates in the water. Zooplankton, a diverse population of microscopic animals, feeds on the algae. Crustaceans, macroarthropods like crayfish, crabs, and fish feed on zooplankton. Fish feed on the plants and crustaceans. Animals like birds and amphibians feed on plants, fish, and crustaceans. pH. Ideally, large systems should have a range of six to eight pH. Fish, mollusks, freshwater crayfish, and shrimp prefer hard alkaline water 
while food organisms that feed into the aquaculture food chain need more acidic conditions, so areas at different pHs are desirable. This can be achieved with deep areas, shallow areas, still areas, and actively aerated areas. Finding the balance for your system between all those variables can take some tinkering and will in the end be unique to every situation. The nitrogen cycle. Distinct from the soil nitrogen cycle, the aquatic nitrogen cycle is equally important. Plants, fish, and microbiology are all interdependent as they transform nitrogen into different molecular arrangements. Oxygen concentrations determine the types of nitrogen available much as pH does in the soil. In an aquaculture setting, it can be easily managed and controlled by adding plenty of plants and monitoring fish densities. Stocking. Some fish can be stocked one per gallon, 3.7 liters and some one per cubic centimeter or inch. Knowing your fish will usually tell you how much you can fit in your system at maximum capacity. If you fish breed, they tend to overcrowd quickly. Be ready with predator fish, perhaps in a caged area and reserve to help keep populations within oxygen levels. Predator fish that are roughly the same size as their prey fish will not feed on them. A rule of thumb is that the predator fish need to be at least three times as big as their prey for them to feed on them. The maximum stocking rate is a limit, not the ideal, nor does it take into account all systems, each of which is unique. Keep that in mind as you observe and learn from your aquaculture systems. The pond's edge. The more edge, the better, especially in pond design because it provides more areas for plants and sheltered habitats. A wavy, meandering pond edge has nooks and crannies for frogs and other animals to hide from predators to lay eggs in to provide more organic matter input to provide more food for fish and to allow for different pHs to develop for more complete cycling of pond waste and nutrients. Fertilizer and soil. Rich and abundant nutrient accumulation occurs in ponds and all aquaculture systems over time as organic matter and silts settle at the base of the pond or tank. When our systems become choked with plants or filled with sludge, we can harvest the plants and the sludge and aerobically compost them, adding the finished products to our garden or food forest soils. In turn, ponds can be fertilized themselves with inputs from land, such as animal and bird manures. This fertilizer causes a flush of growth, which is harvested before it occupies too much of the system and chokes off the oxygen levels. This can be composted or used as direct mulch. Mussels can also be used to clean and add phosphate to the water and subsequently to enrich the sludge and plant growth in the pond. Fertilizing a pond and using a pond to generate fertilizer is easy. Aeration. Water aeration can occur in a number of ways. Oxygenated water input, water pumps, falling water, or orientation to the prevailing wind. Always have a way to aerate your water. One parts per million oxygen is too low for almost all fish while well, five parts per million oxygen is a good minimum for overall pond health. On warm summer nights, heavily vegetated ponds may experience a dip in the oxygen level. Having, an, having a low oxygen detection system, an automated aeration system may be desirable. It is always best to aerate and filter water through gravel and plants as it enters a system. Gravels and other stone filters develop bacteria that digest nitrates in the water as it passes through. More oxygen equals more life. Warmer water equals less oxygen. More oxygen equals more fish. More fish equals less oxygen. Cage area. Having fish in a caged area allows food and natural elements to grow and flow through their area without letting those fish free to be eaten or eat other fish. It is a great way to control population growth. Protect fish and protect plants. This can also be useful to grow smaller fish or organisms to feed to larger fish, yourself, or other animals in another system. Restricted area. Having a restricted area for filtering plants, smaller fish, and delicate habitats to remain protected from larger fish protects the entire ecology's health. This can be done with screens or even a simple rock wall that doesn't allow those larger fish to pass through. Pipe releases. Warm surface water in summer as well as cold water from the bottom of the pond in winter can both negatively affect pond life. Both can be siphoned off a pond with pipes and valves. This can help keep temperatures tolerable for pond life during the extremes of the year. A pond can even be drained quickly with a valve just above the base of the pond. 
Fish feed. Fish can be fed using the plants in the ponds. Plants on the edges, crustaceans in the pond, and insectary plants like mulberries hanging over the pond to drop insect covered fruit to waiting fish. Sweet potato and black soldier fly larvae together make great fish, duck, and chicken food as is done on Zaytuna Farm. Duckweed and other floating plants will feed fish as well. Fish can be fed other fish using screens, cages, and through multiple ponds with different stocking variations. Different forms of waste attract different forms of fish food. Worms are attracted by kitchen scraps, ants by bones, and grasshoppers by the color yellow. Termites are drawn in by woody biomass, snails by moist areas of the garden, and even cockroaches by rough mulch. We can grow our own fish food and save money and energy. Even a simple light over the pond at night can attract mosquitoes for fish to feed on. Placing rocks beneath the light allows for smaller fish to exclusively harvest the mosquitoes. This is a win-win for farmers and fish. Rabbits and other fish can be housed over fish ponds as well to provide passive feeding of the fish. Often this can only be done temporarily as too much manure can imbalance a pond. Temperatures and salinity. Every species has a range of temperature and salinity that it prefers and usually a slightly wider range that the species can tolerate. There are species that prefer fresh water, some that prefer salt water, some that prefer a brackish mix. These conditions exist in all climates. All designs must take these two factors into account for any diverse self-managed system to emerge. We can choose the most resilient fish while making the highest quality microclimate for our site. This increases our margin for success and reduces the margin for error. But in the end, it is trial and error with observation and reflection that will ultimately guide any successful system. Start with researching the systems of your area, the fish that thrive there, their needs, and what you can mimic on your site. Islands, decks, and floating gardens. Floating islands with plant species thriving on them are great to feed fish since they can be edible vegetation in the middle of the pond, adding even more edge. A traditional bamboo or PVC piping framed raft will hold the mulch soil and plants just above the water surface. Lake Inlay in Myanmar still boasts a vibrant aquaculture system to this day that supports the Intha people with garden vegetables grown on floating gardens. While practiced for thousands of years, the recent introduction of the water hyacinth with its buoyancy and size has greatly expanded their ability to build floating gardens. Compost is placed on top of the water hyacinth leaves and then covered with dry peanut branches. The peanut branches provide shade and reflect light with their high albedo while they wick moisture from the water up onto and over the compost where the vegetables, mostly tomatoes for Rangoon, are planted directly in the compost as pictured. In areas with milder temperate winters, decks can be made for duck houses to give them easy access to water and us easy access to eggs, sleeping ducks with no access for predators. No doors are needed on the water side because predators will not enter the ice cold water. To avoid predators visiting in winter by walking over ice, position the duck deck so the opening is just beyond where the water enters the system. It will not freeze over there because the water is constantly moving. Physical islands can be created when ponds are initially built for ducks or other waterfowl so that they are housed safe from foxes or other predators. Strategically and securely place boulders or stones a stride's length apart can make an invisible path to the island for people but not for predators. Rice. A temperate and tropical staple food, rice is an aquatic plant eaten all over the world. North American wild rice is a tall annual grass that was grown by Native Americans from Florida through Canada. In Asia, rice paddies maintained for centuries host several different rich polycultural arrangements of plants and animals, often ducks, tilapia, and crayfish. There are issues with fields that go anaerobic, releasing methane gas. Masanubu Fukuoka's method of strategically and temporarily flooding fields is now being used in a variety of ways and places, including Asia, to adapt these wet systems to minimize anaerobic tendencies of permanent paddies. Read more on Masanubu Fukuoka in the Permaculture in Action chapter. Commercially available rice is high in arsenic likely due to arsenic in the fertilizers being used or already being present in the water runoff precipitation or soil. The rice is cleaning the water of arsenic, but unfortunately is passing the arsenic on to us when we consume it. 
it is not recommended any longer to consume commercially available rice daily because the arsenic levels are too high. If you grow rice in a system tested for toxins, it may be sequestering and know for certain if your rice is arsenic free. Rice and fish farming go hand in hand in Asia, especially in China's rice paddy terrace systems, which are in some cases over a thousand years old. The fish manure feeds the rice plants and the native carp feed on native plants, leading to less pesticide and fertilizer usage. And many argue that no pesticides and fertilizers are even needed. Natural swimming pool. Natural swimming pools are pools or ponds that use biofilters to clean the water. There are numerous do-it-yourself models online, as well as professional services for natural swimming pool installations. Hot tubs are being filled with plants and pebble beds to filter the water for the main pool area. Aeration is needed, but can be attained in several ways, especially if converting a standard in-the-ground pool. Without a conversion to make, the biofiltration area can be directly next to the swimming area, so the entire pool looks natural. The pool water can stack functions as a place to raise fish and store water for irrigation, human consumption, and firefighting. Chinampas, channels, and canals. Documented by the invading Spaniards, chinampas are plant growing systems originally used by the Aztec people. They are used in wetlands or in areas with high water tables. The soil is dug out and piled up above the water line until there is a channel of water and a strip of land. You can continue this and transform an entire area into small channels and raised beds. The anaerobic soils from below the water are very rich, but take some time to become aerobic. Once they do, they can grow rich gardens that can be harvested by paddle boat or canoe. It's an effective solution to a high water table. Channels are narrow bodies of water that connect two larger bodies of water. They are an edge effect multiplier. Channels connect separate aquatic habitats as well as connecting water to areas previously separated from water. This exponentially increases interactions between plant and animal species. Canals are large diversion drains for irrigation as well as narrow bodies of water that connect boats to larger bodies of water. Often in ancient cities, canals with a steady flow served as their municipal water and sanitation services. Water coming in was clean water. Water going out was dirty, but soon gone. This seemed to work until populations grew too large or some other complication would reveal how untenable that practice was. Vetala Palma, Spain. Once drained for raising cattle, Vetala Palma returned the waters, restored the wetland, and is now a fish farm that is 27,000 acres, 11,000 hectares of marshland and canals. It is a biologically rich ecosystem that is nearly all edge. It is one of the largest private bird sanctuaries in Europe, as well as one of the few fish farms that do not feed their fish. The shallow, sun-drenched canals frequently host algae blooms, which lead to vibrant, healthy, and abundant shrimp and fish populations, which in turn attracts incredible numbers of birds in great diversity. This is all happening as the farmers are harvesting fish to sell yet they do not feel like they are in competition with the birds. The health and abundance of the birds themselves indicates the health of their ecosystem and the fish they are harvesting. And the best part is, there is always enough fish for all. Their system is often referred to algae culture, which is similar to Joel Salatin's grass farming, by focusing on the photosynthetic point of content as the support of their enterprise. They've organized systems that are both regenerative and sustainable for as long as the sun shines and the seasons turn. Learn more about Vetalapama here, vetalapama.es.